Uh, but I've titled today's message, A Growing Ministry. And so as we, as we come into this morning, uh, let us remember that this study through the book of Acts, that we are, we are looking back uh, to the early church. We're looking what uh, Luke wrote, Dr. Luke. He penned this stuff. He, he, he recorded this stuff. God moved upon him, and we have this here. We've got a collection of snapshot narratives. Look to your neighbor and say, snapshot narratives. Okay, now that'll be stuck deeper within your heart about the book of Acts. We're, we're, we're getting these things here over the chorus, covering a span of about 30 years, different events that occurred over that span of time. And, and these snapshot narratives, it's not giving us the full picture. We don't have all the details to these things. But what we do have is enough to understand that in the early church, at the birth of the church, when God was nurturing the church, and, and when God was growing the church in first century Christianity, that these are the people, that these are the stories, that this is the stuff that was going on. You and I can understand that now in 2024. I don't have to have a, uh, you know, uh, I don't have to go to Bible college to do that. I, I, I can just understand that very simply about this. And now let me ask you this, this next question here. Let's see if we remember this so far, that, that we have two primary characters. We've got the Holy Spirit, but then we have two primary characters that are kind of followed through the course of the book of Acts. Who are those characters? First one starts with a P, and second one starts with a P. There they are, both of those. Those are the two guys. So, so you see how far you've gone here today. You understand your Bible much better than when you first walked in. You realize Acts, work of the Holy Spirit, covering about 30 years, covering in snapshot narratives, and there's two primary characters that are looked at. There's other people that are mentioned, okay, but there's two primary characters that are followed, Peter and Paul. And, and, and what is going on with these guys? Well, uh, the Holy Spirit worked in and through them as they were sharing the gospel, as they were advancing the work of ministry. And we understand that as we move through the book of Acts, that we are capturing the big story of what God has done and even more of what God desires to do within our lives even here today. Because God is still at work. The Holy Spirit is still at work. And so we arrive at chapter number 10 and as we, as we come into chapter number 10, I want us to take note of, 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 of some of the significance that are happening and some of the things that we've even seen so far, okay? So let's, let's start by doing it this way. Uh, take a look at the screen. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 16. He said, he says, I also say to you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Uh, hold it right there for just a second, okay? Come right back, okay? So the snapshot picture here is this, that Jesus is in the scope of ministry with his boys. He takes his boys on a field trip out of the area around the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum and all that. He walks them north up to Caesarea Philippi, up by Mount Hermon. As he's taking them north there on this field trip, they're having a conversation along the way. And, and Jesus is asking them the question, well, who do men say that I am? And then very specifically, well, who do you say that I am? And then this was the answer here as Jesus starts, after, he, after the, the, the guys give the answers, the disciples give the answers, he starts responding. And Jesus says, I also say to you that you are Peter, speaking directly to Peter right now. Any question about who he's talking to here? No. Pretty clear on that, okay? And he says that on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Move on to the next slide. He says, and here's the key for us, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of what? And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So, so Jesus is talking to Peter very specifically within those verses. And as he speaks to him, he's speaking to him about what he is going to do, that he was giving Peter the, kingdom, the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Very, very, very simple. Now, as you and I are to understand this, this is not kooky, spooky, and weird. In fact, this is not even for you. This is for Peter directly to Peter. And as we, as we understand this, we should understand that there have been three significant events that have taken place up to chapter 10. What are they? Well, here they are. Take a look at the screen. That Peter opened the doors of faith first at the birth of the church at Pentecost. So in Acts chapter 2, Peter opened the door of faith to the Jews. This is what he was doing. The Holy Spirit fell on that time, and, and it was in Jerusalem. Uh, some say that it was, uh, you know, there in that area of the, the southern steppe region, on that, that portion of, of, uh, of the Temple Mount and all that stuff. But the Holy Spirit fell in that area upon the Jews. God started the work. He birthed the church right there. Second thing that happens, okay, is in Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, the door of faith was opened to the Samaritans. 
Uh, you'll remember that, that, that there were those that were going around preaching the gospel and all of that stuff. And then up in Jerusalem, uh, Peter was called down to go to Samaria. And when he comes to Samaria, what happens? The Holy Spirit fell. Okay, this is the opening of the door to the Samaritans. They were half Jew and half something else. The, the half-breeds is what they would call them, but the Samaritans. So, so, so again, understand this, three significant events. The keys of the kingdom of heaven were given to Peter. Peter took the word of God, the Holy Spirit failed to the Jews, to the Samaritans, and now the very third one is that as we show up here in Acts chapter 10, we see the door of faith open to the Gentiles. But the Holy Spirit in this chapter falls the same way that he did at Pentecost with the Jews in Acts chapter 2. He falls here in Acts chapter 10, and this is that third uh, door that is open for the kingdom of heaven, if you will. We're dealing with people groups, Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. In this room, uh, I would imagine that uh, most, if not all, everyone is a, is a Gentile. So the work that God has done in Acts chapter 10 becomes significant to you in the continuation of the expansion of what God is doing, what God has set out to do, Christ has saved us, church was birthed, and the work and the presence of God's Holy Spirit expanding the work and working in and through us. And it brings us to our very first idea here this morning, and that is God is preparing both sides. Acts chapter 10, follow along as I read a handful of verses here. It says that there was a, a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, what was called the Italian regiment, a, a devout man and a one who feared God with all of his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, that's about 3 p.m., he, um, he was clearly in a vision, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, and when he observed him, he was afraid, and he said, what is it, Lord? And so he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is, he is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And so he had explained all these things to them and he sent them to Joppa. God, we ask one more time that you would send your Holy Spirit to teach us and that you would transform us, that we might understand you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the first idea, God is preparing both sides. Now this scene that we're looking at, sometimes it's helpful to to. Um, you know, just, just kind of wrap our mind around or, or understand it, uh, you know, what is taking place. At the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2, it has, it has started 10 years prior to this scene that we're seeing here in Acts 10. Okay, that's when the Jews came to faith. That's when, uh, or, or, or faith was offered to the Jews. You see, the, again, the birth of the church. So the Samaritans followed. And, and here, by the time we get to Acts chapter 10, it's been about 10 years that has passed by. There's a long time that has gone on. And I love that because God is always at work in the background. God's at work, but sometimes we, we, as, we as humans, you know, we, maybe we're the ones that are slow on responding, if you will. Um, I don't know what your salvation story is, but I know that, that God was preparing somebody to minister to you physically as another person. And I know he was preparing your heart to receive that ministry as the Holy Spirit opens up your eyes of your understanding, as the Holy Spirit brings you to the cross that we might receive that grace, that we might receive that forgiveness and for me, it took about a year and a half. These Christian guys were ministering to me and they were inviting them to me to church. And quite frankly, I, I went to church a, a number of times with them. I was not a believer, but I sat in the church and quite frankly, uh, we had, um, in that church that I was attending, there was bleachers in the church because it was like on a, a high school basketball court. So you sat in those hard bleachers. It wasn't fun to sit there for an hour and a half. It was, it was my butt really hurt. So you guys are super blessed, even though those chairs might be hard today. <laughs> You're really blessed considering, you know. And, and, and so, you know, I, I would go, I would hear, I could, I, you know, I could understand what they were saying, but it wasn't resonating within my heart until I came to that place of hitting rock bottom on that night, man. On that, that night, May 7th, 1993, many of you know the story. Right there, things are falling apart. One year of marriage, have a young daughter, Jody and I, and I shoved that gun within my mouth. 
And that's where God needed me to get, that rock bottom place right there so that I would look to him. It's not that he couldn't show his grace to me in any other way. It was I was too stubborn to release and to allow him to do what he wanted to do. There was many more on-ramps and and, and, uh, invitations, if you will, that came from his hand, but I was so stubborn it took me to get to that place. Now, if if you'll consider everything that is going on here, we should understand that salvation is always a work of God's grace. But he does use believers to dispute or to diffuse, rather, his work amongst people. And we know this because of what the book of Romans tells us. Take a look at Romans. Romans chapter 10, it says this. Paul's writing, he says, but, he says, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. I want you to take off your shoes for a second. No, I don't. <laughs> that would be weird. <laughs> no shoes off, please, okay? <laughs> but, but can we understand that? Can, can we understand that, 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 that God works in such a way within our communities, within our lives, you know, and, and he puts different fellowships within the, uh, you know, the, the, the fragrance of our community, okay? And there's different churches here. And he's using different people to do different things. And, 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 and God called me. I'm from San Diego, California. I'm not from Denver, Colorado. Uh, you know, I, I, I came here 20 years ago. Most of you know my story. But then we moved up here to this part of town because God was calling us up here to plant a church. And we planted this church. And we started in the rec center. And this was a little more than 12 years ago now. And all that to say is that, that God, he, he chose me and called me to come into this community with a particular personality that I have to bring his word to speak to some of you that only respond to very direct communication. Some of you only get that language. Some of, you, some of you, while you might have a soft heart on the inside, you're stubborn in nature, and it really, takes, it really takes that presentation of the gospel message to be like front and center right before you so that you pay attention to what's going on. And so if your spouse drug you in here, maybe they're saying, hey, man, you need to pay attention to this. <laughs> okay. But that's how it works, and that's, that's completely okay. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Because you know, everybody here has a different personality. That's totally cool. I mean, we're all different. But I just want you to understand that from the perspective of the scriptures, from the book of Romans, it is God bringing that work of salvation. It's a work of his hands, for sure. But he raises up, he uses believers to diffuse his work amongst people, and he chooses the way that that is done. Uh, We at this church, or here at this church, I should say, not we, but here at this church, we understand that while our doors are open to everybody, we know that this church is not for everybody. Not everybody can handle this type of in-your-face communication. Not everybody needs that type of thing. But for those of you that are able to settle in here, it's because God has called you here. And, and when you're here, you're to allow your roots to grow down and to be firmly established. And so as we look back to the scriptures here, what do we see? Now, God is working out the details of faith behind the scenes as it pertains to Cornelius. He's going to use Peter to, to bring and to distribute the gospel message. And God's going to do that. But at the very opening verses here, in verse number three, one, two, and three, we see that Cornelius, what was he? He was a Roman centurion, and he was given a vision from God. Now, we should understand this about a Roman centurion. Uh, Number one, that they were a powerful person, okay? And then they had charge over about 100 soldiers. Secondly, we should understand that that the relationship that would be between a Jew and a Roman, let alone a Roman soldier, was kind of a brittle relationship. In other words, they didn't like each other. And what God is doing here is something that is supernatural because this this Roman soldier, he catches a vision. He's a guy that had a heart for God in some capacity. And and, and this angel shows up here and says, hey, Cornelius. And and, and Cornelius is not quite sure. He's like, what's going on? I mean, is this a good thing, a bad thing? What's happening? But, but, But the angel gives him instruction as to what to do. And he follows through on this and he sends a couple of his guys in one uh, one soldier escort, if you will. He sends three people down uh, to go down to Joppa to meet with Peter. And on the other end of this, what was happening? Well, God was also preparing Peter to take steps of faith. Look in your Bible, um, Acts 10, uh, scroll down to verse number nine. It says this, it says, uh, the next day as they, these are the servants of Cornelius, uh, they went on their journey and they drew near the city. 
Now, Peter, he went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And then he became very hungry and he wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he, and he saw heaven opened. And an object like a great sheep bound at four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to Peter. It was God. What did he say? Jesus says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter responds. He says, not so, Lord. That is our first cue right there. If it's Lord, you're not going to say no, okay? If God is leading you, the, the, this is a pro tip, okay? okay? Pretend like you're going to Home Depot to go to the pro desk, okay? This is a pro tip. If God is calling you to do something, you don't say, no, Lord. It doesn't work together. It's an oxymoron, okay? But to Peter's credit, you know, he, he's, he's, he's been a good Jewish boy, and, 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 you know, and he's lived his life in such a way as is staying apart from those things. And so, uh, you know, what takes place? Verse number 14. Again, Peter said, no, Lord. He says, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke to him again. And the second time, what did, what did the voice say? What God has cleansed, you must not call common. And so God was speaking to him about something. God was saying, listen, man, here is the next step of faith that I have for you. And I think that we can, I think that, I think that this verse probably speaks to us uh, in many more practical ways than what we even realize. Because we have prejudices. We have these pride things. We have all these things that get in the way of, of really just following the simple leading of God's Holy Spirit. God leads us into things that are according to his word, but many times they're beyond what you and I understand maybe in the moment. Let me give you an example. Um, back in 2007, early part of 2007, <clears throat> um, a young man came to my house. He was dating my oldest daughter, and he asked for her hand in marriage. Well, I let this young boy in the house, and uh, I set him on the other side of the desk, and, and, and I knew what, this, what he wanted to talk to me about. And, and he went through as shaky as he was, and he, he asked me, hey, uh, I just want to get permission to marry your daughter. And me, as a very compassionate man, quickly said no. <laughs> it, it didn't take long for me to think through that, like only a matter of seconds. And, and I, really, I really did. I gave that, and I pretty much brought the conversation to an end, and, and he was there that night to... Um, he was having dinner with us as a, as a family. Go figure. Makes for a rocky dinner. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we got up, and I think I sarcastically said, okay, is there anything else you want to know <laughs> like that? I was rude. I was a jerk. Okay, let's be real. I was really a jerk. And we were walking out the door of you know, my little office at the front of the house. and had, like, double doors you go into it. And you walk out, and you turn left to go into the kitchen. He went in front of me. I kind of gained composure for a second, going, oh, my gosh, this kid, you know, I'm boiling up around the neck. And the second I walk out the door, look back to your Bible real fast. Verse number uh, 15. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This verse falls on me right then. No, God brought the verse to my heart right then. And I'm going, oh, stink. <laughs> Pastor Justin married my daughter. <laughs> it's a true story, man. <laughs> right? He is. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes the blessings that happen, we don't immediately recognize those things. Sometimes we don't see those right away. you right. And, 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 and now Peter here, God is preparing his heart for that next step. God was preparing my heart for the next step all the way in 2007. I did not know how instrumental Justin would be to the mission and the ministry of Jesus Christ in the city of Westminster. Man, he's the dude that has ran this project for the past two weeks. I put it all on him. I said, this is your first time. You're going to do it. We're right here supporting you. Man, he's done a fabulous job. Chairs might be a little bit hard, but we'll give him a pass on that for now, okay? <laughs> he's done amazing, right? And, you know, do, 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 you, do you see that? That God is working behind the scenes in your life. He's setting things up within your life. And there are steps of faith that you have to take. And you have to realize that he's going to introduce you to people. He's going to bring people right before you. Watch, don't miss it, that he is prepared for you to minister to. It doesn't have to be this big old plan thing, although you may cover things with prayer. Why? I got something in my back pocket and it's not a switchblade. I, I just remember that this is here because I stuck it in my pocket over here. In first service, young David, I don't think he's in the room so he can, he's out front? Okay, good. He can't hear us. Well, he might be watching on TV and he might pop in or something. <laughs> young David said in first service, 
hey, take the Easter invites and just toss them out, throw them out to people is what he's trying to say. I don't want you to take these Easter invites and toss them out to people. It's not a reverse psychology thing I'm using on you, no. Okay, what I want you to do is I want you to understand that God already has somebody in your life that is prepared on the other side that he wants to use you to minister to. And your responsibility is to find out who that person is. Now, I sit up here and I preach this week by week. I've been telling you about these cards or at least mentioning them for a month. Just this week, I finally, I finally, I finally found who I'm supposed to give this card to. And I gave it to him on Friday. It was on Friday. I gave it to him on Friday. Fabulous. I, I identified the person, I think it was Monday or Tuesday this past week. I go, oh God, you want me to give it to that person. That is it. I get to participate in this. I'm so stoked because I'm, I'm going, well, there's nobody in my life. And, you know, I, I don't know who I can share this one with. Everybody I know comes to church, you know, and all that. And, and no, that was not the case. There was somebody else. And man, I was pumped because I discovered this Monday. Let's just call it Tuesday. I discovered it on Tuesday morning. I go, and I told Justin, I said, dude, I found the person that God wants me to minister to. He wants me to invite this person to church. Now, now understand, God's working on both sides of the aisle. He's working on both sides of this thing. And so I take it. I didn't see the guy again until Friday. And so I give it to him on Friday and all that stuff. Now, what's going to happen of this thing? I don't know. I have no idea. The result is not up to me. It's the response of walking by faith, of realizing that God will open the door of your heart. He will put somebody before you. And it's for you to respond like Peter was doing right here. Peter was responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so I ask you this question. Do we know what a dream is? Biblically speaking, do we know what a dream is? When does that happen? When you're asleep. When does a, when does a, a vision happen? When you're, awake. when you're awake. So you understand that. Numbers 24, I think, magnifies uh, the picture of what that looks like from an Old Testament uh, scene there. But, but, but both of these guys are awake, whether it's Cornelius or whether it's Peter. Peter's, you know, he just happens to be in Joppa up on the rooftop there, right down by the, you know, the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. And man, gorgeous 75 degree weather, sunny. He's hanging out up there. He's praying. That's awesome as they're preparing him food. But, but even in that great place, God was preparing and ministering to him. But if we remember this place of Joppa, we also know this, that there's some other powerful things that have happened there and, and maybe not so good. Because as we were to consider 800 years prior to this event here with, with Peter in Acts 10, we know that Jonah, that he did not respond in faith to the Lord, that God called him to do something and he was up north and he takes off and he runs and he goes down. Listen, watch, watch, follow the projection of this. He goes down to Joppa. And when he gets down into Joppa, what does he do? He buys a ticket and he gets, he gets onto a, a ship. And so he got onto the ship. And then when he was on the ship, what did he do? He went down to the bottom of the ship. He's hiding. And then when he was in the bottom of the ship, what did he do? He laid down. Listen, when we disobey God or we walk contrary to the leading of the Holy Spirit, every step that you will take will be down and down and down and down. You're running from God. A life of a believer is to walk by faith. We are to learn how to trust God for who he is. Trust God for what he said. And, and, and that's the walk gang that we grow in. Because there are seasons in our life where we respond super promptly to the Holy Spirit. And it's like, oh man, I know God was ministering to me. And bam, we respond super fast. And there's other times the Holy Spirit is drawing us into something and we get into uncomfortable areas. It's like, oh, I'm not quite sure if I want to do this. Lord, I love you. I lift my hands to you. And then we kind of, you know, we kind of shuffle and we back away from all of that. Just understand that what Jonah did, he didn't deny that he was one of God's kids, but he, he absolutely denied his assignment from God. And that is something that you and I should think about personally. Have I denied my call? Have I denied my assignment from God? Maybe I could be more, more amplified in this, and, 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 and maybe I should say, because, because maybe some in here are sitting there and saying, well, listen, I'm not a pastor. I'm not a full-time ministry. Amen, and praise the Lord. You don't want to be here. If you can do anything else, do it. Don't go into ministry. If you're called, well, you, you're called. You have to go, okay? But if you can do anything else, do it. But your life, maybe you're married, maybe you have kids, maybe you're single, maybe you have a job, you know, whatever, whatever your situation is, that's your situation, but the, but the very special thing that God has given to you, it will be diffused through those regular things for sure. But there's something very specific that he has, he's created you for. And my question to you is, is that have you allowed the Holy Spirit to identify that 
in you? And have you recognized that that gift is for the body of Christ? For it's to be used to strengthen the body of Christ. Jonah, he was a Christian. No, he wasn't a Christian. He, this, this is before the church. He was a follower of God. He was a prophet is who he was. His affiliation was still there, but he ran from his assignment. And I want you to realize that the point behind all of this is, a, is as we make application is that God is at work aligning people to do his will. He's aligning both the conditions and the opportunities, the conditions of our heart and the opportunities that are set before our face. And he's working on both sides of the aisle. You never have to force through any type of door. You never have to kick something down to create opportunity. And I think this is where we as the body of Christ, we get this wrong. And if we see and we use the book of Acts, again, this is, a, this is a record of what the Holy Spirit was doing. The Holy Spirit was preparing both sides. He had a work that he wanted done. He, Holy Spirit. He prepared Cornelius' heart. He prepared Peter's heart. Both of those things under a normal condition would collide with each other because a Roman soldier had no tolerance for a Jew and a Jew had no place for a Roman soldier. There's, there's a natural collision point that is there. I hope you can recognize that. But I also hope that you can understand in the, in the principles of, of, of studying the book of Acts that God is the, is the one that lines up these supernatural moments and the easiness about walking with the Holy Spirit in the church age is that he does the work. It's not us tripping out on this work. And if that puts you to sleep, I would tell you this. You need to be shaken up so you pay attention to what God's doing within your life. You need that. You need to be shaken up. And how does God do that? How does God get our attention? He allows the things around our life, the stress points. It doesn't have to be a tragedy. God is so gentle, but he allows the stress points to come into our life that he might be able to get our attention. Idea number two is this. Peter and Cornelius meet. Uh, look, look in your Bible, Acts chapter 10, verse 23. Here's what he writes. It says, then he invited them in and, and he lodged them. Uh, so, so Peter invites in Cornelius' services down in Joppa. And on the next day, Peter, he went away with them. And some brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Acts 11 tells us that there were six guys that Peter took with him. And what did they do? They take this, this trip. They walk 30 miles north out of Joppa up to Caesarea Maritima. Uh, by show of hands, who's been to Israel with me in this room this morning? Okay, you folks have been there. This is the very first stop that I take you to, Joppa. And then we go on to Caesarea Maritima. Uh, and there's opportunity for other people. We've got a trip coming up next year. If you haven't been, you should consider going to Israel with us. And so, verse 24, it says, The following day they entered Caesarea. Now, Cornelius was waiting for them, and had called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And he talked with him. And he went in and he found many who had come together. And then he said to them, Peter said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to uh, one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore, I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, uh, for what reason have you sent for me? And so Cornelius said four days ago, and then Cornelius gets into this telling what's happened. He was fasting, he was praying, and there was a vision, and, and all of this stuff happens. I, I just want you to recognize this. As Peter uh, arrives there at this place, Cornelius immediately goes to this place to where he, uh, a Roman centurion, he falls down at the feet of a Jewish man. God is up to something crazy. That is, that's absolutely amazing. And I love this about Peter because, you know, it, you know, it's like this. It's like, oh, finally, those Romans are bowing down, right? You know, Peter, Peter could come in with this entitled mentality. He could come in like a rock star. He could come in like, yeah, it's about time you Romans are bowing down, right? He didn't have any of that. I mean, his natural response was immediately to go and to pick him up. No, 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 no. Stand up. I'm just a man. I'm just a man. The, 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 man, he, he demonstrates and he plays out something that is very important for you and I to recognize, and that is, is that we should never touch God's glory, now, look what happens on the other side of the coin if, if, if you do touch God's glory, if you do take that to yourself. Ruin is, is certain to come. In, in just a couple chapters ahead, Acts chapter 12, take a look at the screen. Here's a situation that happens with Herod Agrippa. Uh, 
That's all right. It's a double screen. It looks good now. That's good. <laughs> Acts 12 and 22. This is with Herod Agrippa. This is in, right there in, in Caesarea, okay? It says that the people were there. They were shouting. So they're there in the little uh, half Colosseum type thing, and they're shouting. And what are they saying? The voice of a God and not of a man. Next verse. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him. Struck who? Herod Agrippa the first, okay? Herod the great's grandson. This is who this is. Immediately the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to who? God. And he was eaten by worms and died. This is a pro tip right here. Don't do this, okay? It's not good. Uh, you know, history tells us that it was a few days later, you know, whatever these intestinal worms are that came and however God put that in there, dude died. But we can recognize this, that Peter had the right perspective. He understood that, that just like Cord Cornelius, that he too needed the grace of God. And what are the lessons for us? Two things. Number one is we stay humble as we minister. I gave you a classic example here of, of um, you know, pushing off of something as, as a young man coming to ask for the hand of my oldest daughter, you know, back in 2007. You stay humble. When we stay humble, it doesn't mean that we get everything right. But what it does mean is this, is that we're flexible to change when God shows us a better way. That's key. Secondly is this, we don't touch God's glory. You know, there's, there's things that are happening within your life all around, and it's only to God be the glory. There's things that are happening within your church, only to God be the glory. And we don't want to be like Herod Agrippa the first here who touched God's glory, who, who was receiving the accolades as people were praising him. Everything gets turned to the Lord. Now, you might say, well, I, I don't think that's ever going to happen to me. And I would say, hang on, hold your, hold your voice right there for a second. Because as your years pass in your life, as you go through life, you get older, right? Would you agree on that? Yeah. You were this age yesterday, you're a different age today. You get older. And the comforts of your life change. Maybe you can remember, uh, you know, I don't know what your experience was like, but I was out of the house at 17 years old and, and fending for myself. And it was very hard, 17, 18, 19, 20, right? You know, early 20s and all of this stuff and, and just trying to get established within the world. It was a struggle. It was difficult. But it seems like invariably as time goes on and, and the days pass and the decades go and kids grow up and all of this stuff, and there, there are some different comforts that come into your life when you no longer have to care for kids. I'm not putting parents down or kids down for that matter. I'm really just saying is that there is a difference when you're not having to, to carry a, a certain type of load and there are certain comforts and conveniences that come forward. And if we're not careful, if we're not anchored to gospel truth, then we go by way of, of those that have gone before us because our default setting within our hearts is to wander from God's truth. Let me see if I can show this to you here. Hosea chapter 10, verses one and two. This is not the church. This is Israel. But Israel was blessed of God. And I would, I would, I would suggest to you that the church is very blessed of God as well. Either way, the people of God here it is. How prosperous Israel is. There's a statement. And then a parenthetical statement is, is, is put in place, amplification with that dash. That's a dash. Here's the amplification. A luxuriant vine loaded with fruit. But the richer the people get, the more pagan altars they build. The more bountiful their harvests. The more beautiful their sacred pillars. Next verse. The heart of the people are fickle. They are guilty and must be punished. The Lord will break down their altars and smash their sacred pillars. Oh my goodness, I'm so glad we're in the New Testament and not the Old Testament. That's heavy and harsh. But is it really? Understand it this way. Recognize it, very simple. Let's bridge the gap with language, okay? Very simple. The hearts were divided. How so? Because the more that they advanced, the more that things got easier for them, the, the, the less passionate they were for God, the less faithful they were for God. Listen, when we're in desperate places, when we're in desperate spots, when we have grave needs, how close do we stay to God? Oh, Lord, I'll do whatever you say. But what changes from that place to the place of comfort? Nothing should change for a Christian because he's Lord of all or not Lord at all. Right? Do we understand that? Okay. All right. Now, now don't get beat up from your feet up here. Don't, don't, I, I appreciate you uh, uh, going along with simple understanding. What God gives to us is not to thrash us. But you can understand this, or we can understand this, that God's heart is to protect his kids. And this is Israel. And, and, and we've got some very, um, Hosea, a prophet. We've got very prophet-like language coming forward. 
if we can understand that God, he does not want us to stay stuck into this place of idolatry. Many of you were here when we went through our First John study at the very final verse of First John chapter five, the very, very end. Last verse we read in the entirety of this study was about keeping our hearts from Id- idols, for not getting preoccupied with things. As we move through the course of life, if we're not careful, as the years pass, the comforts increase and all of these things, if we're not anchored to gospel truth, our hearts by default will wander from God. God does not want us to wander from him. And so what does he do? I mentioned this last week, that he chastens us. Not a dirty word, it's a good word. It's he comes in, he picks us up. He wants us to increase virtue. How does he do that? By sharing the light of his word so we understand where we are and so we understand where we're to go. He raises us up with his grace, with his goodness. His compassions and mercies are every uh, new every morning. So as we're stirred up and we get up in the morning and start our day, God has already gone before us. And when we're wrestling through things where we've gotten off course from doing his will, you and I should understand that it's the goodness of God that brings us back. Prophetic language for Israel, they have been through all kinds of wars and all stuff. Oh, in fact, they're still in wars right now. All that to say is that we see the radical prophetic prophet-like language that is coming in and smashing and tearing. But God does want to tear down and free you from the shackles that hold you back from making progress with him. Did you know that? It's a little bit quieter, right? Right, okay. So, so if, he has to, if he has to walk you through things, don't be afraid of him walking through those things because understand that there's greater freedom and greater victory on the other side of those things. That's the problem that we have in our churches. And, and listen, I'm just as guilty as the next. Oh, I'll stand up here and pound the pulpit. I love to preach. It's fun. You gotta try it. <laughs> it's fun. But the heart of God is still the same. And the church has to be reminded of this. And we come to the final thing because it's time to close the the service here. Our final idea, verses 34 through 48, back in our text, is the gospel is preached. That's it. I'll read to you the entirety of this because you'll get it. I mean, we see it together. Peter gets there, and then all of a sudden, what happens? Then Peter opened his mouth, and he said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, that word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And uh, those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have just received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And then they asked him to stay a few days. So the gospel is preached. We can see this very, very, very clearly in here. Whether it's the life of Christ, the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, all of this is, is, is contained here. And this is what Peter is simply passing on. And as he's passing this message on, as he's sharing that with the Gentiles, God had already prepared the heart and it's so beautiful. Sometimes there's not much of a message that is needed to be preached because hearts are prepared. 
And man, this is, this is the opportunity that you and I get. We get a chance to prepare our hearts all week. We leave here Sunday and we go through a whole week and sometimes we can get off balance. But, but, but the benefit that we have is that God desires to prepare our hearts so when I come in this Sunday morning, I'm already attuned to his voice and he's speaking to me new things in the moment. He's given me further direction for the week that lies ahead. This is the gospel message. And what Peter said here in the gospel message, he, he starts out in verse 28 that God hasn't shown um, you know, what does it say? God has, has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone as, as impure or unclean. In other words, we shouldn't have these prejudices in sharing the gospel. How do you feel about right now, about feeling the, uh, feeling the gospel message with a, uh, with, with a Palestinian in Gaza? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about the, the nonsense that our politicians have put upon us and, 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 and this crazy, ridiculous, homeless, d- drug-intoxicated environment that has been produced for us? How do you feel about sharing the gospel message there? Listen, there's no prejudice in the gospel. God shows no favoritism, verse 34. We should understand that, that we can't earn favor with God. In verse th- 36, we should understand that there is, there's peace with God only through Jesus, He's got to be Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. It's a gift of grace that is conditioned only by believing in Jesus. He's the Lord of my life. You are Lord. That is believing in Jesus. And then sometimes we get lost in this easy believism that that, that Satan wants to push upon us. And so many people are swept up. Well, I believe in Jesus. And you look and you say, well, no, you don't. I see how you live. If there's life, there's evidence of life. Uh, Do me a favor. Go like this. Take your two fingers like this. Got it? Put them on your neck. Do you got a pulse? Is there signs of life in you because you have a pulse? The answer would be yes in that. If there's no signs of life for you as a Christian, then chances are you're not a Christian. That's a hard message? No, no, no. That's that's that's, That's a message that needs to be understood and recognized. He's Lord of all or not Lord at all. Now, you might struggle through sanctification. Fine, different story. We're not perfect people. That's not what he's asking. But he's asking to be our God. He's asking us to believe in him. He's asking us to accept his grace, the forgiveness of sin. And you know, man, you know, you know, you know when God takes away your sin because you're a different person, man. Not a perfect person, but a different person. In verse number 41, Peter also says that God has has chosen us to be his witnesses. A saved life is a changed life. How so? Because we're now witnesses. We're, We're witnesses of what Christ has done. And the interesting thing is, is that when we turn it back towards the church here and we start considering here in um, 2024, there are a lot of people that can be very religious and do great things and yet not be saved. That is a fearful thing. Do we realize here at the start of, of all of this that Cornelius, he was doing a lot of religious things and it was great and, and people were talking great things about him, but he didn't get saved until the end of the chapter. It's very interesting as we consider that. And so too in our churches, I want to encourage you not to be a religious person and do great things. I want to encourage you to respond to Jesus and be a saved person. And as, as, as this chapter closes off, just recognize that the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself was poured out upon the Gentiles and, and, and that work extends into this room right this very second. The work that God has done extends right here into this room. And as Peter was preaching Jesus, as I just read to you through all of that, you'll, you'll remember that those that were listening to what he said, that's who the Holy Spirit fell on. They had willing hearts to turn to God with everything. Not just, well, Lord, here's half of my life. God doesn't want half of your life. He wants all of your life or none of your life. That's a salvation message. And, and, and we need to preach that to our young people. We need to preach that to our old people. We, we, we need to, to hopefully recognize that for ourselves, that God wants me all in, not partially in. It's a, it's, a, it's a message of renewal, and we may struggle from time to time. That's, that's fine. There's not a challenge with that. The challenge is, is remaining ignorant to something that we should know. That's the challenge. Don't remain ignorant because the tactics of Satan are, desi- are it's his desire to draw you away and to destroy you. And God's desire is to shield you and to protect you, which is why he wants you all in, which is why he wants us close to him, which is why he doesn't want us to wander away. Right, we've got some of those Old Testament pictures and we talk about the shepherd and we talk about the, the little club and all that stuff. And what happens to, the, to that little wayward sheep that keeps wandering away and keeps wandering away? What, what, what happens? Breaks what, he breaks his leg. How, who told you that? No, don't answer that. I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> but we, <laughs> but we, we get the understanding of that. And then what happens to that little stubborn sheep? What, is a, what does a shepherd do? Come on, go ahead. Sh- shout it out. Puts him on his shoulders and carries him, right? keeping them very close. 
And sometimes chastening comes in, and some, some of your lives are in, a, are in, a, in a, a little bit of an uproar. Some of your life, you've not successfully gone through transition because you're afraid to let go of this to grab onto that. God is with you. If God's for you, who can be against you? What do you have to fear? Will it be uncomfortable in the moment? Perhaps it might be. But will God abandon you and leave you? He will not. He will see you through. And if you could understand this, if there's a hot coal within your hand and you're hanging onto it, no, this is the only thing I have. And meanwhile, it's burning you and tearing up the tissue around your hand, right? God says, man, no, no, no. Don't worry about that. I've got something greater for you. You need healing. Take this out of your hand. Let me heal your hand. Receive what I have for you. You have to let go of the one to receive from the other. There's a gift of grace that God has for you. And my encouragement to you as we, as we finish our time is, is that the expansion of ministry or a growing ministry, realize I'm not talking about the book of Acts. I'm not talking about this fellowship. I'm talking about your life. There's a growing ministry that God wants to do within your life. Will you receive that from him this morning?